To prove the point, we come to the next part of the story. After Jesus kicks out all these people, verse 14, it says, The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. Pause. Blind people were not allowed in the temple. They were stained by their disfigurement. They were not allowed to enter in. Lame people were not allowed to go into the temple. They were restricted from being in the temple. But these people ignore the rules, come into the temple, and Jesus heals them. He says, guess what? You're in the temple now, you're in my temple now, and boom, you're accepted. And boom, I will solve your problem so that you can stay. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Now, of course, why are they indignant? Maybe they're indignant because of the messianic yelling of the children. Because the messianic statement, Hosanna to the son of David, could get them into trouble with Rome. Rome might say, oh, wait a minute. We hear messianic stuff. We're going to start killing people. And so maybe the, the Jewish people are worried about the messianic statement. No, I don't exactly think so. I think they're more worried about the fact that children are making noises. Because you know children. They're supposed to be neither seen nor heard. Maybe sometimes seen. No, that's the, that's the script of the day. But you know, you've seen Jesus all the time. He welcomes the little children to him. I think these people were probably upset at just hearing children at all. But verse 16, do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, I love that. Jesus is like, sure do. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth your praise? And then that passage. It's another quotation. It's another Old Testament quotation. And so I'm going to give it to you because it's just so funny. Psalm 8, verse 2, says this. You have taught little children and infants to tell of your strength, silencing your enemies and all who oppose you. Jesus is looking at these teachers of the law. He's looking at these chief priests and these scribes, and he says to them, oh yeah, have you ever read the passage where, Jesus ta where, where God talks about the, the praises of the children? That's the passage that is supposed to shut people like you up. I love it when Jesus looks at a person and just basically tells them, you know, just keep, keep your mouth shut for a little while longer. You don't know what you're talking about. Everything that's going on here is about the outsiders being allowed to finally come in. And God, from the foreigners, from the children, from the lame, from the blind, from anyone, God will receive worship from anyone. So this is the part that I'm kind of scared of. Um, luckily, I don't have any time to get into it. Yesterday, I was thinking there were a couple issues that I really wanted to talk about, and I spoke to Jen, my wife, and she's like, don't talk about those issues. Instead, give a whole list of issues. And I said, okay, we'll do that one. That's, that's easier. I'll bury all of, the, all of the things together into a big list. But here's the question. If you're a Christian, then as far as God is concerned, you're an insider. You're here at church. So in some respect, you're an insider. If you're here at church and you feel like you're probably supposed to be here at church, you're an insider. If you're here at church and you feel relatively comfortable that you're here in church, you're an insider. We're insiders together. The question is, if we're the insiders, are we also participating in this bigger picture worship of God, or are we, like the insiders of old, doing something to keep the outsiders out? That's a really hard question for us to answer. So I made a list. I made a list of some things that I think uh, insiders do, religious people do, that keep outsiders out. 
I'll start with the easy ones. Religious people can expect the people who come into their group to wear fancy clothing. When we expect people to wear fancy clothes, that's one of the things that keeps outsiders out. Now, I'm happy to see that most of you around here are not wearing fancy clothing. I'm happy to see we don't have a whole lot of really grandiose outfits happening in this room. And you should know that I'm comfortable with things like jeans and polos and sometimes even shorts on a Sunday. I'm not going to go that far myself, but you know, I'm not going to judge anyone else. But anyway, so here's the deal. When people, when we first moved to town and we started sending out postcards, letting people know we were starting a new church, do you want to know one of the first questions we got asked when people would call the phone number on the postcard? They would say, say, what do I have to wear when I come to church? Now, luckily, you know, it's years and years later. We don't really have that much worry anymore, but there's still some people, some churches, some environments where someone might say, no, you got to wear fancy clothes. And you know what? That just keeps outsiders out because maybe they can't afford, maybe they don't want to, maybe they haven't been raised in church with certain expectations. And so if everybody's wearing a suit and tie and someone walks in in shorts and a t-shirt, they're going to be like, I don't feel comfortable around here. And they might just turn right around and walk away. Another thing that religious people do that keeps outsiders out is when we fail to explain what we're doing and why. Listen, there are a lot of Bible metaphors. There's this one metaphor um, in this one song that sometimes you guys have heard, uh, over the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Uh, there's a bridge in there that says that God uh, chases down the 99. And uh, one of the questions that you might ask is, um, what's the problem with that? And one of the answers I would give you is that how many people from the outsider world would have any idea of why God would be chasing 99? Uh, why would he be leaving 99 and chasing down whatever he's chasing down? Um, it's, this, it's this picture that Christians know, insiders know, that the good shepherd leaves 99 sheep in the fold to go after the one who's lost. But a non-Christian isn't going to know that. Um, I've heard songs talking about the Rose of Sharon. I've heard songs talking about uh, swing wide, you gates. Uh, and it's like, okay, what, when Christians don't explain what we're doing, Outsiders can feel like outsiders. Let's keep going. Another time is when we fail to welcome and befriend newcomers. If you're a newcomer in our church, we don't want you to stand up and announce your middle name to everybody. What we want you to do is interact with people. We want to befriend people. We want to have friendships going on in this place. And when we fail to do that, we keep the outsiders out. Here's another one. When churches with lots of money ask for more money, that keeps the outsiders out. They're like, I don't, I don't want to be part of that thing. They're just going to ask me for my money, and I don't think they need it. Or here's another one. When churches with loads of people don't do anything to make life better for loads of people. I don't know if I want to be around all those people. They're not making life better for the other people. That's one of the things that might keep... Now, we don't have those problems. We don't have lots of money, and we don't have lots of people. You know? and so, so right now, we don't have a lot of those judgments against us, but there are a couple that I want to talk about that might connect with us. Here's just a few. When Christians pass judgment on non-Christians. I want to be very clear about this. If a Christian tells a non-Christian that their sexual behavior is wrong, the Christian has skipped a step. What the Christian should be doing, the Christian should be telling the non-Christian that there is a Jesus who loves them and will forgive them from anything they've ever done, and that you are ready to be their friend along the way. It's only later on, down the journey, down the road, when the person says, you know what, I am ready to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior, that you can then say, well, the kingdom has a few laws in it. The kingdom has a few rules in it. But until a person is in the kingdom, they're not bound by the rules. So when a Christian judges a non-Christian, that just keeps the outsiders out. And it reminds them that they've got no reason to come in. Here's another one. When Christians attach Christianity to a political platform or social policy, 
No, I'm not saying you can't have an opinion about a political platform or a social policy. What I'm saying is wrong is anytime a Christian acts as if their Christianity is the reason why they support this particular political platform or social policy. And basically, I'm not going to go too deep into that right now. I want to say a couple things in just a moment, but I'll give you this third one here. The third one is when Christians broadcast disdain or ignorance to the world around them. That's another thing that keeps the outsiders out. I use the word broadcast particularly because we live in a social media age where a Christian can tell the whole world what they think and why they think it. And one of the problems with doing so is that when a Christian tells the whole world what they think and why they think it, that Christian sometimes acts as if it's their Christianity that is causing them to have this opinion. And then what they're doing is they're attaching this Christianity to a thing that is not about Jesus and then also broadcasting that out as a Christian representative of those things. I'll just quickly say a few things about that. Um, Do you realize that Christians are way more likely, statistically speaking, way more likely to believe the earth is flat, to deny climate change, to disregard public health measures, to um, believe that the election was stolen, and to believe a whole host of other sorts of things. And I'm talking statistically, Christians are more likely to be any of those things, including being QAnon supporters and all that other stuff. Christians are more likely. Now, maybe you're hearing me say that if you think those things, you can't be a Christian. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that for some reason, and I don't know all the answers, for some reason Christians are more likely to fall into all of these different camps for some reason. But here's the thing. Not one passage in the Bible or anything Jesus said has anything to do with denying climate science, rejecting public health measures, or any of these other things that I mentioned. Not one thing in the Bible, not one thing in Christianity relates to any of those things. And so when a Christian goes on social media or in their family circles and begins to act like there's something about their Christianity that has connected them to this particular thing, then they are giving Jesus a bad name. My wife um, works in a highly technical industry. She's a software engineer. And there was a period of her career where only two people on the planet knew a particular thing that happened inside a computer when a programming language gets turned into a program. Only two people. Jen was one of them. The guy who invented it was the other one. My wife was the other one. And she had to learn what was going on because her company wanted to do stuff with that stuff. Now, listen, I could try to explain it to you guys, but that wouldn't work because I can't explain it to myself. All I'm trying to say is my wife is pretty bright, okay? She's pretty smart. She knows what's up. She knows what's going on. So she's working with these other guys who are incredibly technical, guys with PhDs and all this kind of stuff. She's working with these other guys. And one day, a couple years ago at lunch, she lets slip that I, by the way, they already know that her husband is a pastor. They already know that we came to this town to get this church started. They already know some of these things. And she lets slip during lunch one of these days that I have been watching and criticizing and making fun of flat earth YouTube videos. Okay, she lets that slip. And the guys at the table around her do this. (gasps) Oh, we're so glad to hear that you're not one of those people. See, they knew she was a Christian. They knew she was smart. They knew she was good at her job. But they also thought that maybe because she was a Christian, she was also one of those flat earthers, people who believe the earth is flat. Why in the world? Well, it's because statistically speaking, Christians are far more likely to believe that the earth is flat, far more likely to reject science in lots of different ways. Uh, And 
As a matter of fact, the, Christ, the people who were online promoting flat eartherism were also simultaneously saying it was from the Bible and promoting their own Christianity alongside. There were many flat earthers who ended their videos by saying, come to Jesus, he will save your soul. And so the connection between the flat earth theory and Christianity was so strong in these guys' lives that for however many years, I don't even know, but for however long it was, they knew the smart woman who was working with them was one of those people and probably one of those those people and it was such a relief to learn that yeah she was a Christian yeah she went to church yeah her husband was a pastor but yeah she also didn't follow some of this other stuff here's the point we as Christians have an uphill battle to go when it comes to reaching the world around us for Jesus. And as a church, we have an uphill battle to go when it comes to reaching the people around us for Jesus. And so I'm going to ask you to join me in three specific things. Three specific questions I want you to join me in asking yourself as a way of making sure we insiders don't keep outsiders out. Here's question number one. Have I attached anything to my Christianity that is not actually Christ-like. If you have an opinion, that's fine. You can have an opinion that doesn't show up in the Bible. I'm not going to tell you all the opinions that you can have and can't have. What I'm going to say here is that don't attach it to your Christianity if it doesn't look like Jesus. We cannot attach anything to our Christianity if it doesn't look like Jesus. Number two, the next one. Am I presenting myself to an unbelieving world as unwelcoming? Am I presenting myself to an unbelieving world as a, I've got all my stuff together and you don't and so I'm just going to tell you what's going on. I'm just a mic drop Christian constantly dropping little mic bombs on other people saying, ah, here's one more reason why I'm better than you. Do I come across as a person who is welcoming? And number three, is our church doing the work of welcome? I think the answer... I, I think to answer that third one, it's currently no. We are not doing much to welcome the outsiders. But we're planning on making October a month of major welcome. And so as we ask these questions of ourselves, we are preparing for that day. Okay. I've taken up a ton of your time today, but this passage ends with just a few quick little things that round the whole story out. There's just one problem. It's also scary. So let's do it fast so we don't get too scared. All right? Here we go. It starts in verse 17. And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany where he spent the night. Write this down. After this whole confrontation with the religious people doing their religious things in their religious places for religious reasons and the outsiders being out, Jesus leaves. Jesus, the biggest insider of all, himself doesn't stay in the city. He goes outside the city to be elsewhere. Number two, verse 18. Early in the morning as Jesus went on, was on his way back into the city, he was hungry. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it but found nothing on it except leaves. Then he said to it, may you never bear fruit again. Immediately the tree withered. And some people are like, Jesus, how petty are you? It didn't have fruit on it. Why did you curse it? Why did you cause it to wither? I mean, what's the point there? After all, it's springtime, isn't this? is Palm Sunday. It happens in the spring. You know, Easter happens around Passover. That's in the springtime. Figs don't grow on the trees in the springtime. Jesus, what are you doing? Why are you so upset at the fig tree? You know, why are you being so petty or whatever, cursing a fig tree? Here's the point. Figs are interesting. Figs grow in male and female varieties on the same tree. There are male figs and there are female figs. The male figs grow first. The female figs grow later because of the flowers of the female flower get pollinated by the male flower, the male figs. And so as a result, the male figs grow first. We just don't eat them because they're not that good. They're edible. They just don't taste that good. And here's the deal. If you ever find leaves on a fig tree, the male figs are there too. That's the way it works. The male figs grow at the same time and the same rate as the fig leaves. It's later on that the female figs grow. So here's the deal. Jesus sees a tree and Matthew tells us it has tons of leaves on it, 
but no figs. The point is, this was one of those trees that was acting like everything was normal, but didn't have anything real. This was one of those trees that had all the show of being a normal spring fig tree, but didn't actually have anything going on underneath. The best word for this is hypocrite. Jesus cursed a hypocritical fig tree because this was one of those trees that had everything on the outside going for it, but you lift that leaf and there's no fig underneath. He's like, I'm done with hypocrisy. I'm done with hypocrites. I'm done with this. And so, fig tree, you're done. And so the disciples are freaked out. They're like, okay, what's going on here? And so then Jesus says this, verse 20. It says this, the disciples saw this. They were amazed. How did the fig tree wither so quickly, they asked. Jesus replied, truly, I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to this fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. So many people take verse 22 all by itself, out of context. If you believe, you'll receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Prayer. And so that becomes what I call the Ferrari passage. This is the passage that gives me permission to ask God for a Ferrari and to demand that he offer it to me because after all, it says it, I believe it, that settles it, right? And so I should be opening my door tomorrow to a Ferrari. Now, these days, I really would rather have a Porsche. I told you guys all about this a few weeks ago, but that's neither here nor there because the passage was taken out of context. Lose it. Keep it in context. And what you have is Jesus says, I judge the fig tree, you better believe it. I judge that fig tree for its hypocrisy. And you can too. If you have faith, you will hear what I'm about to say. You will believe what I'm about to say. You might even pray that what I'm about to say happens and you will see it happen. If you have faith, you will say to this mountain, throw yourself into the sea. We're done with you. I don't need you anymore. As they're coming from the Mount of Olives down, there's a thing in front of them called the city of Jerusalem. And in the middle of the city of Jerusalem, there is the temple. But the temple doesn't sit at ground level in the middle of Jerusalem. If you remember that Old Testament passage, referred to the temple sitting on the holy mountain. Today it is called the Temple Mount. It is where the temple used to stand. A few years after Jesus says these words, some marauding forces from the Romans come into the city of Jerusalem and tear down the temple. And it has never been rebuilt. And I tell you, just like the judgment of the fig tree, if you believe, you can say to that mountain, we're done with you. Get out of here. Throw yourself into the sea. And it will happen. I believe Jesus is declaring judgment on the whole temple scene. He's not saying you can pray for anything you want and God has to do it. He's saying, listen up to what I'm saying. And if you have faith to believe what I'm saying right here, right now about God's judgment on hypocrisy, then you could point at that mountain, this mountain right in front of you, and you could say, we're done with you. And it will happen. Here's why that's scary. The temple was filled with insiders doing insider things for insider reasons and insider purposes. They were following God's will. They were following God's law. They were doing everything they thought was right in the eyes of God and everything that he had said. There was only one thing. They had missed a few little details. One of those details is that they were doing their insidery thing, keeping the outsiders out. And that was the hypocrisy that was enough for Jesus to say, you're a fig tree with no fruit. You're leaves with nothing underneath. You are hypocrites. You are just absolutely playing the religious game. And so I'm done with you. Be withered. And here is the answer. The group of Christians, wherever they may be found, 
If they are insiders who keep outsiders out, they will wither and face the judgment of God. If they are insiders who invest their energy on bringing the outsiders in, they will, I believe, have the blessing of God. That's who we need to be. As individual people in the way we live our lives, as individual people in the way we do social media or whatever else it is that we're part of, and as a church, we need to be those people who bring the outsiders in. And over these next couple of months, I want us to work at it. I want us in the month of August to dig deep in our prayer and say, God, what is it that is causing me to keep the outsiders out? What is it that is causing me to view myself as an insider, a privileged insider? And where is it that I need to change, that our church needs to change, that we need to somehow be broken down so that the outsiders can be welcomed in? What needs to happen, God? That's what August is about. September is us practicing it, trying to figure out some things that we're going to do. And October is us really getting it done. Because here's the deal. A temple that doesn't let the outsiders in gets thrown into the sea. A fig tree that looks like, it, like it's got everything going on right but doesn't bear any fruit is withered. And both of those things happen from the judgment of a king who says, I will fight the oppressors even if the oppressors are the people who think they're my followers. We got to be people who bring the outsiders in. And so in response to that, I think we need to pray and ask for God to lead us in it, to change us, to challenge us, and to transform us. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, there's so many ways that we can offend people around us. Help us to only do it for the right reasons. Help us to only allow the offense to be the cross itself. When we say that all people are sinners and they need the forgiveness of a Savior who died for them, let that be the only offense. And let us be people who strip away all of these other things that we've attached to our Christianity. Strip away all of the other habits and practices that just we've been doing forever that seem to make total sense, but at the same time, they keep the outsiders out. Help us to strip, strip those things away. And help us to be people who can have a house of prayer for all nations. Lord, there's so many difficult things in our world today. So many lies that all of us have believed about so many different things. So many things that we have taken personally as if they are important. God, I pray that you would just help us to strip that stuff away. I pray that you would help us to get back to being Christ-like. I pray that you would make us into a family, into individuals, into a church that welcomes the outsiders in so that this world can be transformed maybe one last time for the cause of Jesus Christ and his kingdom in this world. We love you. We thank you for giving us this time, this challenge from your word. And we thank you for the strength of your spirit to help us live it out in great ways this week. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go into the world this week, not as an insider, but as an inviter, and get the rest of the world to recognize that Jesus himself is the greatest inviter. Let's bring the outsiders in, because the family is for them, too.